I'm really excited today because today we're looking at an anniversary of the Articles of Confederation, and I'll explain that to you in a few moments, but I love talking government and I love talking constitutions, and I thought it would be really appropriate because I think we so often will hear a reference to the Articles of Confederation, and for most of us in taking our history, you know, high school, college, whenever, the articles get sort of a passing, normally there's someone the teacher will say you know, our first form of government was the Articles of Confederation. It wasn't very effective. It did a couple of good things. And then you launch right into the Constitution. But I'm of the theory that the Articles of Confederation are worth sort of taking a more in-depth look because I think the lessons we learn from the Articles of Confederation is why when we put set down to write the US Constitution that period 1787 to 1789 that we we're able to draft a document that is still in existence today and still in existence with less than 30 amendments, 10 of those having been part of the original constitution. So the founding fathers did something right because we had once upon a time done something so wrong, so wrong, I mean, so pitifully wrong that they had a mandate to, to correct all of that. So as I want to do, as historians do, let's back up a little bit and talk about how we get to this idea of being creating some sort of a union. And I will tell you the very first proposal to unite us together in some sort of a union came about in 1754. And it was Benjamin Franklin who proposed it. I mean, it's kind of amazing when you look at that colonial period of history, how often Benjamin Franklin, you know, this sort of wizard of Philadelphia with all these obviously ADHD with all these vast interests and talents. But one of the things he began to realize early on, you know, even prior to the French and Indian War was the fact that, that we would be stronger as, as colonials in sort of advocating for our own rights if we could somehow join together and speak with you know, one voice. So he came up with something that he called the Albany Plan because they happened to be uh, a group of people meeting in Albany, New York, when they were talking about, you know, things that needed to occur. And, and so he proposed the Albany plan um, that would be some sort of a joint coming together as a loose union, but with states retaining rights, or at that point, colonies retaining rights. Um, by 1775, as we are on the eve of an actual American Revolution, having gone through the French and Indian War, having dealt with a lot of the impositions of British Parliament as far as taxation, quartering of troops, um, inability to trade in the ways that we wanted to, the Intolerable Acts, the closing of Boston Harbor, all those sorts of things. Um, the Second Continental Congress becomes our government at that point. And yet the Second Continental Congress had no legitimate authority to me. Uh, I, I want you to think about that for a second, because you know I I I have these images in my mind, you know, that that painting that everybody knows of Jefferson and Franklin and Adams presenting the Declaration of Independence, Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston presenting the Declaration of Independence to John Hancock, and you think of that as a, our legitimate government, but yet there really was no authorization even for the Second Continental Congress to be meeting. The, the request had gone out, people had come to Philadelphia, but we're gonna find that in those days as that's happening, a concern about is this simply a group of rebels getting together or what do we do to give them legitimacy? And, you know, that's something I don't think I ever thought about as a young person, you know, because I knew the outcome. I wasn't thinking about in, in the time in which it occurred, what were they thinking? Well, Thomas Paine in 1776, we all know and love Thomas Paine, summer soldier, sunshine patriot, all of that, argued in common sense that it was a custom, his word, custom of nations to demand a formal declaration of independence. He's the one who first mentions that idea. And then he mentions the fact that if 
we declare, if we being the colonies were to declare the Declaration of Independence, that none of the foreign powers would give legitimacy to that unless we were something other than rebels fighting against a mother country because at that point, then anyone getting involved would be getting involved in a civil war. And that it was necessary if we wanted to have a relationship with foreign powers that could probably help us. So Payne, Payne actually concluded, and this is his quote, and I'm looking over at my sheet, it says, the custom of all courts is against us and will be so until by independence, we rank ourselves as a nation. So how many of you have seen the musical 1776? Oh my gosh, we, on that bus that we're going to have to travel around, we've got to have a screening we have to watch. 1776, it probably comes as no surprise to anyone, is my favorite musical of all times because it is basically the Second Continental Congress, all of the leading characters writing the Declaration of Independence, but they're doing it in, in music and singing and dancing and everything. And I say that because all of this will sort of come to a fruition when you have on June the 7th of 1776, Richard Henry Lee introduces a what becomes known as the Lee Resolution to the Continental Congress, and it's a three-part resolution. Those of you that have seen 1776, there's this wonderful thing, this wonderful movement and song, because the delegates are looking around and they, you know, there's this key group that is indeed Ben Franklin and John Adams in particular, who are sort of musing among themselves, how are we gonna get, get a resolution introduced and get it passed for independence? Who, who are we gonna to get to introduce it? And they're looking around it and they really come down to the fact that if it's going to happen, it has to come out of Virginia. Now, why Virginia? Well, one, because we see Virginia as the founding colony, you know, our first permanent colony is Jamestown. And, and then the Virginians had always sort of seen, seen themselves as the lead in that colonial government. So they decide that they're going to go to Richard Henry Lee and they're going to send Richard Henry Lee back home to Virginia to where the Virginia legislature House of Burgesses is meeting in Williamsburg. How many of you have been to Williamsburg? Okay, adding that stop on the bus also for the rest of you. And, um, and they go to Lee and, and historically it's accurate. Richard Henry Lee was an incredibly gifted man, but he was also a, a little bit flamboyant and a little bit arrogant. So, you know, Adams and Lee go to Richard Henry Lee and say, Richard, you know, we need this resolution for independence. We need a resolution to create a nation. And, you know, they're saying all this and they're saying, but who can we get to do it? Who, oh, who can we get to do it? And Richard Henry Lee's listening to them. And then Richard Henry Lee goes, me, I can do it. And of course, that's, that was their plan all along. Now, in reality, was it quite so dramatic? Probably not, although the, the records from the Declaration uh, Conference do indicate that Richard Henry Lee basically volunteered and said that if Virginia did it, everybody else would follow suit. You know, if Massachusetts did, everybody knew Massachusetts was small and irritable. They were constantly fussing about something. So, you know, nobody was gonna follow Massachusetts. New York was just odd, even though they were large. Pennsylvania was sort of stuck in the middle, but Virginia was the root of, you know, colonial civilization or such. So Richard Henry Lee in the, in the musical has this wonderful song where he says, here Lee, there Lee, everywhere Lee, God always leans on the side of the Lees, the Lees of Virginia. Of course, Richard Henry Lee is the father of Light Horse Harry Lee, who is the father of Richard, e, or Robert E. Lee. So, you know, there's a long military tradition within the Lee family. So anyway, and um, on June the 7th of 1776, Richard Henry Lee comes back to the, con to the Congress and he introduces a resolution. And basically what he's asking for is that a committee be created and that they come up with three things. They need to have a declaration that will announce their independence. They need a, they need a draft of a treaty so that they can have um, 
foreign relations with other nations and they need a standard treaty so that if if they apply to, to be friends with somebody, it's like a dating agreement or something, so that if they apply to be friends, they'll have a sample and then they can just whip that puppy out by you know someone writing it. And then they need to create, and Richard Henry Lee's words are a firm league, a relationship between um, between the 13 colonies. So they appoint, the Continental Congress appoints a 13 member committee. We're gonna do everything in 13s because there are 13 colonies and everybody, you know, everybody has to be represented on every committee or Rhode Island's feelings will be hurt. Maryland's feelings will be hurt. You know, some of the smaller of the colonies get their feelings hurt. So they put together a 13 member committee and then they're gonna break them into these three subcommittees, which is how we end up with you know, Jefferson and Adams and Franklin and Livingston and Sherman on the Declaration Committee, but there will be some overlap. John Adams will bounce between all three committees as will Benjamin Franklin. So anyway, so they will go to work. Now it's not gonna be real easy because twice in the process of, of trying to put together all of this stuff, you know, there are some really knockdown, drag out battles, but they are able to come back on July the 12th. So really it's a month to the day. They come back and they have ready to present to the Congress, the Declaration of Independence, which of course will, they will begin signing on July 3rd and it'll take a little bit of while, but they also have a system of a firm league between the colonies that will eventually become the Declaration of uh, the Articles of Confederation. So then they now they have this mandate to create a system of government. Now they have to figure out something that will make everybody happy. And some of the same problems that we've talked about with the Constitutional Convention occur in, in this Confederation discussion. And that's how do you balance the wants and the needs and the capabilities of of colonies of such varying sizes and population. So they get to work. Um, while they're writing, twice they'll be forced to leave Philadelphia because the war gets so close. So they'll pack up all of their books, their trunks, and they will head out. They'll go to Baltimore one time. And the second time they actually go to Lancaster out in York County, Pennsylvania, um, where they will finish the writing. But they do finish their work and the first draft of the Articles of Confederation is ready to be signed a little over a year later in November of 1777. Interestingly, nine of the 13 colonies will sign it within the first month or so, but it will not actually be signed by all of them until 1781 because Maryland will be the holdout. Maryland is very concerned about Western lands that the states claim beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And they are concerned because they have no Western lands and they are gonna be little and powerless forever. So there's this huge argument about all of that. So, um, but they have the final draft ready. And interestingly, the Articles of Confederation, and of course the hint as to what will be a major problem is the fact that it's a confederation. But so going into drafting, the Articles of Confederation, the delegates go in with certain already uh, preconceived notions. And, and I'm gonna try and walk us through real quickly. The first thing is going into it based on their experience with England, with the monarchy, even though it's a constitutional monarchy, but with the monarchy, with a strong parliament that controls things. And even though there has been since the Magna Carta, this presumption that no man is above the law, no taxation without representation, that wasn't what the colonial experience had been because we were not as colonists. We, of course, you know, all of us were there in 1776 and 1777. We were not truly English citizen. So they have this fear of a strong central government. They, uh, they didn't like the fact they didn't have representatives, but they also did not like the fact that parliament was so strong that they could demand money, that they can impose legislation and everything. So what is their, they go into this, this meeting, the committee does with an assumption that whatever form of government they create is going to be a very weak national government. You want a national government that can do what you need for them to do, but not be able to do anything you don't want them to do. 
that sounds relatively simple, except you've got 13 different states trying to decide what do you not want them to be able to do and how much do you want them to be able to do? So anyway, you know, with the Articles of Confederation, you're gonna have some real concerns about giving too much power to the central government. The second thing that because you have a 13 member committee and you have at least one person from each state divided in some way on those three committees and they're talking to each other, there is a great concern among the, sp the smaller states or the more rural state. Georgia so often identified with the smaller states because Georgia was so far removed from everything. They always felt like they got the word after stuff had happened. And there was a lot of truth to that, but there is a real concern that the smaller states will be dominated by the larger states in the national government. So how are you gonna keep that from happening? How are you gonna keep a Virginia or a New York or a Pennsylvania or a Massachusetts, which is a small state, but a very vocal, very um, a long tradition of dominance in the New England area? How are you gonna keep those states from dominating other things? And we'll see what they do as we begin to examine some of the, the way that the, the, Cong the uh, Articles of Confederation Congress will be structured, but in their attempt to avoid domination, they're also going to be a, they're going to affect the effectiveness. Um, so let's, let's talk for a minute about, you know, the Articles of Confederation and, and some of the fascinating things that you find in the Articles of Confederation. So one, the Articles of the Confederation is the first time in Article One that says what we're going to be called. It's the first time in writing that we are referred to as the United States of America. That's pretty significant. Um, they will then go through and sort of structure, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. They will structure the government in such a way that power will rest in a legislative body, but there will be no executive and no ju judicial branch as such. One of the things that I find most fascinating is that of the 13, and there are 13 clauses, 13 is some sort of a holy number here, but one of the 13 clauses um, talks about that if English speaking Quebec chooses to join the Confederation, they will be given equal status with the 13 English colonies in what is now what was about to become the United States. There was some anticipation and Franklin had traveled back and forth several times attempting to get that to happen if there was to be a war. You know, he had this sense that the war was coming, the Declaration of Independence was gonna lead to that. And, and we know now going back and looking at notes from that Second Continental Congress, there was a full expectation that Quebec would also rebel against Great Britain and would then choose to join with these American colonies in creating this United States of America. One reason why America was chosen because, um, you know, we so often talk about, in fact, it's considered inappropriate today to say American history because all of this hemisphere is the Americas. So now we say U.S. history or United States history, which is you know, a hard thing for some of us, even though we know that cerebrally to, to shift to that, to that language, but Franklin truly believed that English speaking Quebec would join with us. Um, he was rather annoyed when that didn't come into fruition. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what were some of the weaknesses let me look at my clock. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, let's talk about weaknesses with the Articles of Confederation. Um, when, when Maryland becomes the last one to sign in May of 1781, then at that point, the Articles of Confederation will become the governing body. Up until that point, we were operating under basically the Articles of Confederation, even though Maryland had held out and hadn't signed for a long time. So the Second Continental Congress has been acting as the legislative body. The president of the, of the Continental Congress then was serving as president of the United States. So sometimes you'll, you'll get the trivia question that will say, well, there, there, were, there was a president of the United States prior to George Washington. Well, technically that's sort of true because the last president of the Continental Congress, once 
the ratification or once the agreement is all signed in 1781, technically is president of the United States, but not really because he never has any power and he's never able to do anything with it. So, so what are the major problems with the Articles of Confederation? Why is it that they will, they, the Articles will be so ineffective that we will eventually go, oh my Lord, we need something better. Let's draft a new constitution. Well, the first problem is there's no money and there's no power to, to raise money. So Congress, according to the Articles of Confederation, Congress can request money from all 13 of the colonies. Congress can spend money. Congress can't print money. And in fact, for most of the period of the Articles of Confederation, each state will print its own money. And if that's not confusing, that's why, you know, when we draft the real constitution, there's all that stuff about interstate commerce and the differences between interstate and intrastate and, and why the US constitution is so clear about who will mint money who can print money and all those sorts of things is because no one knows how to deal with money because of the Articles of Confederation. So for example, let's say that Congress, um, they have the power to tax only by sending out letters to each of the, the 13 legislatures saying, we have this issue, this problem, whatever, here's what it will cost and they would technically prorate it based on the wealth of real property held in each state, each at that point their states. And then those legislatures had to agree and had to then voluntarily send the money back. Well, they don't. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about the idea of building a federal road, let's say that we're talking about the idea of building canal systems in New York State, Georgia doesn't care. Hoopity do. So New York State wants a canal, let them dig it. You know, if Pennsylvania needs a wilderness road to go out to the Western frontier, I love that frontier in, in the, you know, in the 1780s, Western Pennsylvania is the frontier, but if they need a road, a wilderness road to go out to the frontier, then the other states are sort of like, well, yeah, that's a great idea. That'll benefit Pennsylvania, let Pennsylvania pay for it. So there becomes this increasingly difficult situation in which unless they can truly see that it is a benefit to all states, the states will not give money. And I'll give you a prime example. So by 1780, won. the war is basically over. The Battle of Yorktown occurs in 1781. And from that point on, there's going to be little skirmishes, but they're ready to go off to negotiate a peace treaty. George Washington, the Continental Army, those soldiers that had signed up to be a part of the Continental Army had been promised that they would be given lands and they would be given half a, a pension that was half of what their signing agreement was, how much they were going to be paid uh, for their year of service, you know, that they would be given a pension for the remainder of their life for one half of that amount of money. So technically the war ends in 1781 for the most part. Everybody goes home. You know, everyone's looking for their land grants. Now, eventually the land grants will occur, but a lot of them are not going to occur until after we have the U.S. Constitution in place. So you've got a lot of disgruntled soldiers. You also have the soldiers who go home. And, you know, I used to try and remind people, unlike today where you, you may even be career military, there, was, there were very few people that were career military at that point. Remember, George Washington had been a, a colonel during the French and Indian War, but when it ended, he came home and went back to planting crops in Virginia so that we didn't have a standing army. Standing armies made the colonists a little nervous because that was one of the, the intimidation tools that the British had used. So everyone was a volunteer. Everyone had agreed to fight in the revolution. Then people went home expecting their pensions. Well, who's going to pay the pension? The army was a continental army, but the soldiers had joined state militias in most cases those state militias then may have become part of the continental line 
but their records said things like North Carolina regular infantry or Virginia mounted soldiers or cavalry or whatever. And there becomes this huge fight in the Second Continental Congress. Well, who's going to pay those pensions? They were fighting, you know, the argument that you're going to find on the part of, of many in the Continental Congress is they were fighting for joint freedom. Georgians were not fighting for just Georgians to be free. You know, we were either, what was it Franklin said, we will either all stand together or we'll all hang together. But no one wanted to pay those pensions. And there will be a revolt by Shay, in fact, Shay's Rebellion, which will occur out on the Western frontier in Pennsylvania, of soldiers who are upset over the court system. They're upset over the fact that they have, for the most part, been gone from their homes for as many as five years. They've not been planting crops. They haven't been earning any money at home. You know, they've not been increasing their livestock hold or anything. And then they come home, they apply for their pension, and everyone's kind of like, uh, hmm. Well, we're really glad you fought, but the truth of the matter is, you know, those pensions for the most part are not going to go into effect until after the beginning of the 19th century. And so you've got a lot of really, really angry, angry soldiers, which leads us to the second major problem in the Articles of Confederation. So you've got these soldiers out in the western part of Pennsylvania who are going to grab their guns. What are they good at? Well, they fought for years. They're going to grab their guns and they're going to march on the local courthouses. You know, the state and local militias were not going to get into a fight with men they had served alongside. In fact, their loyalty is more to those soldiers who they think have been really shortchanged. And they're not with some, some concept of, you know, we need to figure this out later. Well, figuring it out later doesn't help with the fact that our families are hungry now and that we want to purchase land and we want to do all those things that we fought for independence. There is no standing army and there was no provision in the Articles of Confederation to call together an army because that was one of those inherent fears. You know, we didn't want to be able to call an army as such. And George Washington you know, bless his heart, George Washington becomes incredibly frustrated over the fact that here is an internal threat to the survival of the Republic as we're, well, the Confederation at this point, and there's no real way to, to respond to it. And, you know, he will finally raise some troops, they will put down Shays' rebellion, but in, in Washington's mind, you know, it's one reason why Washington's going to agree when Alexander Hamilton approaches him about calling, getting representatives together to talk about amending the Articles of Confederation. And um, another major problem, I guess third one, is how do you enforce trade agreements, tariffs, um, contracts with other, other foreign powers, whether it be France or Spain or even England, as things are changing, the Netherlands, you know, the Netherlands is a huge, huge economic power at this point in history, but you've got individual states negotiating individual contracts and, and there will be, in fact, a point where in attempting to exercise trade, John Adams is in England and they're trying to put together some trade contracts and, and everything and, and the English are just not, they, they're still miffed over what has happened and everything. So they are, they are not exercising, um, they're not playing fairly. They would contract for things and then refuse to pay for them. So there is an agreement that all of the states will simply no longer trade with Great Britain. So that comes through the Second Continental Congress. Everybody closes their ports to the British except Connecticut, which then sends a letter to the British and says, now that everybody else has closed their ports, come do business with us. We're open, we're ready to do business with you. And then of course the other 12 states are ready to just pummel Connecticut because Connecticut didn't think that anyone else would find out. Really, seriously? <laughs> I mean, how naive are you? Anyone who ever had one sibling knows somebody's going to tell for sure. So, you know, everybody's angry at Connecticut. So there's no way 
to enforce or to control trade or to deal with foreign nations because while we should be speaking with one voice, everybody's speaking with their own voice. While we have representatives of the United States there, we also have representatives from the more powerful states that are over there. And I'm sure the Europeans were looking at us going, <laughs> this isn't gonna last long. These people don't know what they're doing. And of course we knew we did. It was just taking us a while to kind of find that healthy balance. Um, that whole unfair competition between the states will be a real, real issue. And then I think the thing that probably really brings it to a threat that will also trigger part of Shea's rebellion and, and some other rebellions scattered across is so the, the government decides that the only way they can raise money is to impose taxes. Hmm. Well, you know, since the beginning of this nation through today, the word taxation pretty much is a death nail for anyone who is elected to an office. And it, the nicest of people get hostile when you mention taxes. So a decree went out to each of the states saying, we've got to have money to be able, you know, how are we gonna pay for roads? How are we gonna pay the war debts? You know, how are we going to, you know, by 1783, Peace of Paris, we have the land all the way to the Mississippi, but how are we going to expand into that land and, and do sorts of things if we don't have some money to fund things? So the word goes out to the states. The states are not necessarily interested in raising a lot of money, but they will attempt to pass through some levels of taxation, even though Congress didn't really have the power to tax, they're sort of bluffing it. And it gets really ugly when people who have not paid their property taxes, property tax is what they're gonna split because they don't know, you know, there is no sales tax, there's no income tax. You're gonna be taxed based on the amount of property you have because that's your indication of value. Well, then when people don't pay their property taxes, there will be an attempt by the Articles of Confederation Congress, the Second Continental Congress to begin to force people off their land for non-payment of taxes. Now think about that for a minute. I mean, how many times have we seen those pictures of people about to be forced off of their land for non-payment of taxes or whatever, and you have this image, or I have this image in my mind of everybody standing at the door of their cabin with their gun saying, over my dead body, I can, get, I can at least get two of you before you drag me off. And you know, it's kind of like when TVA, <laughs> Uh, began to build the dams and backwatered into the valley. And there are those wonderful old photographs of all the possessions in the back of pickup trucks or whatever, and Granny in her rocking chair with her shotgun as they're being taken off the land. We don't take well to people coming on our land. Yeah, I'm beginning to sound Upper Cumberland, but we don't take well to that. So there's going to be this huge faction that will arm themselves and say, I'm not paying taxes. You can't make me, make me pay taxes. We will we'll die first. We are free people and we are not going to pay for things that we don't support. So it becomes a, an incredible issue. Um, so, you know, Shays Belling Rebellion will bring a lot of that to, to heart. So I'm, I'm telling you all the negative things about the Articles of Confederation because the truth of the matter is confederations are very, very weak forms of government. That's why the South, when they choose a confederation, which is ideal given their political philosophy in 1861, actually in December of, of 1860 after the election of Abraham Lincoln, the idea that its states have all the power, central government has little power, but that doesn't make you a very strong unified fighting unit. So did anything good come out of the Articles of Confederation? Yes. Don't you love that? Negative, 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 negative. Yes, two good things come out of it. And those two good things are one, the Land Ordinance of 1787. Now, by that point, we are beginning you know, to, to talk about a constitution, but it's not in place. And the Land Ordinance of, of 1787 basically sets up how we're gonna deal with those new lands west of the Appalachians. You know, how, how are we gonna deal, especially initially with the Ohio Valley, uh, the states that will become Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, the Eastern half of, of Minnesota that is um, 
this the eastern side of the Mississippi River, those lands. How do you deal with territories and at what level can those territories apply for statehood? We had not ever had to think about that before because we had been colonies in someone else's system. So the land ordinance of 1787 basically sets out the parameters of how the Ohio Valley, how many states it could potentially be divided into, what the population has to be before they can join um, into the United States, become a part of that. And it sets up sort of the guidelines of, of, of how that process will occur. Those will be incorporated eventually into the US Constitution when it's written. Second big thing that comes out is the Northwest Ordinance. Any of you remember the Northwest Ordinance in your American history classes? Yes, Northwest Ordinance. Um, and it created the plan for self-government. It is a reinforcement of how those territories will come in, but it adds two really critical things that, um, that are precursors that sort of tell us there's gonna be a difference of opinion in regional um, politics. But the Northwest Ordinance set, sets aside, you know, how much is a, a, how much is a square, you know, one mile square, how many sections. When you hear people talk about sections, and in fact, that process will be the same process all the way through the Homestead Act in 1863 and everything. But what's really important is the, the Northwest Ordinance says there will be no slavery in those territories, those new territories as they come in as, as states they're gonna come in as free states. They will not have slavery. Um, it's an interesting, it's interesting how that gets through the Articles of Confederation Congress because there's such division, but they do, it does get through. The other thing that I find to be so incredibly important is that as they set off those townships, you know, 36 sections, is that in each of those towns as they lay them out, you know, each town is going to, each of those sections are numbered. There's a grid pattern. I mean, it's very logical. The mathematicians obviously were in charge of that. But section 16 in every town will be a school and education will be provided. Now, it doesn't mandate how many years of education, what level of education, but it will be public education. And it's the first time that as a new nation, we address the issue of education. And I, I think so often today that, that people forget that prior to the Northwest Ordinance, prior to, I mean, the US Constitution, by the way, does not mention education anywhere in the US Constitution. It was such a volatile, divisive concept that, you know, until, until the Department of Education is created, the US Department of Education is created in the Jimmy Carter administration in the 1970s, there is no unified. Education was left as a state, a state controlled program in the US Constitution. So for the Northwest Ordinance to come out and very strongly create this precedent about free public education was very, it was very far future thinking on the part of those folks of the Second Continental Congress, because up until that point, education was only provided if a community could get together and hire a schoolmaster who school would meet in the church building because heaven forbid you didn't need a separate building. You only used the church on Sundays and Wednesday nights and special holy days. So, you know, it'll be a joint school church house and the teacher would live with some family, or if you were incredibly wealthy, you hired your own you know, tutor who lived with you and taught your children. And if you were gracious, you might allow some of the children who lived on the plantations around you to attend that school. So the Northwest Ordinance will change all of that, at least conceptually. The idea that education perhaps is an inherent right. They don't say it in that many, in those specific words, but we know that Jefferson, who is not there at the writing, but Madison is, that Jefferson and Madison exchanged a tremendous amount 
a tremendous number of letters talking about the importance of a literate citizenry to be able to govern themselves. If indeed, whether we were a confederation or as the constitution would create a republic, if we were going to govern ourselves, it had to be a learned society, a learned electorate, you know, that it, that was a requirement that, that you be able to be informed. And I think any of us who have looked at any of those old things of eighth grade graduation test requirements, even a hundred years ago, I mean, I've looked at them sometimes and thought, you know, that's, people can say what they want to about early education in this country while it was you know, there was discriminatory practices limiting who attended those schools. The level of education that occurred in even frontier schools, for the most part, it was amazing. I mean, you think about so many of our early leaders who were educated maybe in those public frontier schools only through the third or fourth grade and then chose to study on their own to to educate themselves, but having the ability to be able to do that. You know, the idea of just reading for the law with an attorney and then setting for the bar and being licensed as an attorney, you know, that precedent, I think probably the idea of the abolition of slavery, but equally important for the survival of this nation was at least the beginning of a discussion about the importance of education. Uh, we're at 517 and I'm getting better 13 minutes today instead of eight. Um, you know, I, I find the whole discussion because, you know, we, we didn't have anything to go on. Um, you know, we can look at the articles of Confederation and say, well, you know, strike, strike, strike. We're about to be out. But the truth of the matter is, is that we, you know, since the days of Athens and Pericles and Demosthenes and all of them setting up Athenian democracy, which was a totally different idea of government, we didn't have a model to go on. You know, the European nations, you know, were practicing monarchy, you know, England and the Netherlands were constitutional monarchies. Everybody else was pretty much an absolute monarchy. And we were creating a whole new system of government. So it only makes sense that we would not be 100% proficient when we first begin to try, but we know what the problems are and the fact that the representatives of the states are willing to come back together. When Alexander Hamilton calls the Annapolis Convention in 1787 and says, we need to look at the Articles of Confederation and you know, not everybody shows up and I've, I've shared this story before and he goes to Washington and says, the only way we'll get people here to fix this is if the letter comes from you. He knew his audience and he knew that if George Washington wrote a letter that said the future of this young nation rest on us perfecting, remember that line, a more perfect union, perfecting our system of government, and then he signs G. Washington, that people would show up and would do that. And, and I think, you know, so often people will say, well, you know, everybody puts George Washington in their top five presidents because he was the first. He's on the money. He's old. He had really good hair, whatever <laughs> their, their reason. I think George Washington, as much as anyone, we talk so much about Jefferson, we talk so much about Franklin and Adams, all of whom I love, you know, I, oh my Lord, you know, I, I sometimes in my mind have my perfect dinner party, some nice glasses of burgundy, the founding fathers around and mothers around the table, I want Mercy Otis Warren there too. And, but I think George Washington for all of his flaws, perhaps in his heart best understood what the dream was. And, you know, and, and I love, you know, even when the military at the end of the war at, because of the pensions and everything, in fact, as the war has already ended, um, come to him and they're threatening rebellion. I mean, he's so savvy 
you know, they're, they're talking about all they're going to do and, and everything. And he takes his glasses off, you know, rubs his eyes and says, excuse me, I'm so sorry. My eyes have grown weary in the service of my nation. And he just stops and looks at all of them and all the talk about rebellion and an overthrow of the government using the military to overthrow the ineffective Articles of Confederation government just disappears. And I think about that moment and think he understood that he was, there was a pivotal point. If the military rose up against the Articles of Confederation government, it would have ripped asunder the new nation. And yet he doesn't tell them they can't do it. Instead, he reminds them that, cause you know, they're upset they don't have their money, they don't have land and everything. But he reminds them that he too has lost a lot in service to his nation. He's been gone from home a long time. But that idea of instead of saying that, simply taking those glasses off, rubbing the eyes, pausing and saying, I'm so sorry, I need to read this letter again. My eyes have grown weary in the service of the nation sort of struck them in their hearts and made them realize that they had little to be upset about, that he had given so much. So, you know, yay for Washington, yay for his willingness to send those letters out to call a convention to improve the Articles of Confederation, which of course, when everyone arrives, they just sort of say, too far gone, can't fix it. Let's write a new document. And I, wouldn't you love to have been there to see all of that happen? I mean, it's just so fascinating to think about. But Articles of Confederation, a huge strikeout, but it got the bases loaded for a home run on the Constitution. That's my one and only baseball analogy. My son-in-law, a New York Yankees fan, will be so proud of me for having said that. <laughs> Linda, I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm frequently and have been frequently reminded of, the, of a quote from John Adams over the last 15 years when he said, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There was never a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. But because we were creating something new that the world had not seen before, what democracies, quote unquote democracies, was he referring to? I think he was fearful that we would become what the Athenians had been, and that was an absolute democracy, and we are a representative democracy. And I think, you know, Adams, Adams believed in a little bit of a stronger central government than Jefferson. Obviously, that was the difference in their political parties, but Adams would have, I'm not certain what Adams would think about total universal suffrage today. And I think he was fearful. When I go back and read, try to read deeply into his writings, he was fearful that when people could get to a point that they're electing representatives based on popular appeal versus based on a true um, addressing of the issues in a a learned intellectual way that even a representative democracy was in danger. And I will tell you, I think often about that quote too, because, and, and Franklin, you know, there's a Franklin quote when he says, when people realize that they can, and I'm paraphrasing, but he basically says, when people realize that they can vote for things that benefit themselves more than they vote for things that benefit the greater good, we are also in danger of losing the democracy. And, you know, you know, he makes that statement about, is it a rising sun or a setting sun? I've sat here all the time worrying, we have a republic, can we keep it? And I think every generation struggled with that issue, but I will tell you, I do, I do worry because we have become so divided and I think and I always hesitate to say this because I'm sure my grandparents would have said the same thing. I do think that we have 
wandered away from that idea of statesman service, patriot, patriotic statesman. And, you know, the Articles of Confederation, I should have mentioned this, had a clause that said any member elected to the Congress could only serve one out of every three years. There, there was a real concern at the beginning of our nation's founding about amassing of power by anyone staying in a particular office too long. In fact, the Articles of Confederation included a clause that said, if and when courts are necessary, no member of the Congress may serve as a judge, a division of power. They didn't call it that. I'm not, I often wonder what Adams, Washington, Jefferson and others would think when you have members of Congress who have been sitting in Congress for 60 years. Yeah. Um, how do you maintain touch with the people if you're not working in the same way? And of course, you know, we talk of, you know, members of Congress initially were only paid their travel expenses. It was not a salary. And we began, you know, we, we created an, an amendment that would then pay members of Congress so that we could have a better representation so that only the wealthy who could afford to not be at home working would not be the only people in Congress. But it's sort of, a, it, it's created a real issue of, so you get elected to Congress, you, you're making a fairly decent salary. I mean, not a huge amount of money by most people's standards, quite a bit by teacher's standards, but, but the power that comes with it then it becomes so much of how do you stay in power as opposed to how do you serve the people? And I think that's what Adams was worried about. I really do. I mean, that's such a good question. We'll all lie awake tonight and, and worry. <laughs> and I do. Oh my gosh, you know, for those of us who love this nation and love its potential and who have grandchildren and whatever I don't want my grandkids to enjoy inner, any less greater blessings of liberty than I have been able to enjoy. So how do we assure the survival of the Republic? Term limits. <laughs> I, well, you know, I'm a big proponent of term limits. I'm, you know, I, I think back to Lord Ab Acton, power yeah. corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. All that yeah. money. I have a quick question, hopefully. Um, so you said that when the land grant, uh, um, maybe I'm not remembering what the, what the document was, for the free states in the Ohio Valley, who were the people and why did they decide to make it free? Because again, that's part of what we were talking about, the decision-making, the voices that were there. I mean, if it was Jefferson and Adams and Hamilton, I'm, um, you know, they all, well, especially Jefferson had slaves. So yeah. how, how did they decide to do that? If, because obviously slavery was an economic uh, value to this, to uh, the growth of this country. So what was the thinking in the room? Or if you were the fly in the room, what was it that made them say, these all have to be free states? I think um, the best that I can determine going back and trying to read the notes and everything from the Continental Congress is that the Southern states went along with it because one, there was no mention of the Western lands that they owned. North Carolina in theory extended all the way to Mississippi. Georgia did also, of course, those will eventually be broken up. There was no attempt to limit slavery there. And in return for their willingness to allow those, North, those northern states to be free, a lot of the war debt for the southern states, the southern colony, southern states was forgiven and assumed by the national. So it was sort of a quid per quo. We don't care what you all do up there as long as you don't mess with what we're doing down here. You know, South Carolina was always the hard sale, but apparently South Carolina got some major concessions as far as as shipping and, and those sorts of things. Hmm. You know, it'll, it'll come back up though when they write the constitution. Right. Yeah, and, and of course in the constitution, they basically say, uh, we'll delay this until 1819 by that point. With any luck, we'll all be dead and somebody else can figure it out. I, don't you love giving gifts to your, your heirs? 